Good afternoon, everybody. Dr Nick Coatsworth with today's national update on COVID-19. To the 24 hours to 12 noon today, uh, we've had a total of 26,912 cases of COVID-19 in Australia, an increase of only 16 newly confirmed cases in the past 24 hours. New South Wales reported four new cases, three were overseas acquired and those people were in hotel quarantine and one person had locally acquired COVID-19 was a contact of a confirmed case. Queensland reported one new case of COVID-19 and that person was in hotel quarantine and Victoria reported 11 new cases. Five were locally acquired and contacts of a confirmed case and six people's COVID-19 cases remain under investigation. Sadly, there were two new deaths overnight, both reported in Victoria, taking the total number of deaths from COVID-19 to 851. These are very pleasing results from uh, Victoria overnight and just a testimony to the uh, immense effort of Victorians, both in rural and regional Victoria, um, particularly in Melbourne and its surrounds, uh, those Australians who have been under a very restricted way of life um, for many weeks now. We would uh, encourage Victorians to keep up the good work. Uh, it is, uh, there is still some way to go uh, as uh, your uh, government and um, health services plan the roadmap out. Um, it is, of course, uh, pleasing when we see numbers so close to single digits um, and uh, the control um, that that implies uh, that we'll be able to uh, keep COVID-19 under, under control. This light at the end of the tunnel is getting closer every day. Um, we would, as we always do, ask for your um, patience. Uh, it is clear that the Victorian Public Health uh, Unit, um, Professor Brett Sutton and his colleagues are taking these numbers into account as they plan uh, further lifting of restrictions, um, but that um, patience as always is required. I wanted to also welcome uh, the announcement of additional funding yesterday from the federal government uh, to uh, additional vaccine research in Australia at the University of Melbourne and the University of Sydney. We're investing in new technologies uh, that uh, are not yet under development in Australia, including the so-called mRNA technology, which is one of the uh, United States-based candidate vaccines, uh, and also another um, protein subunit um, vaccine. Uh, we have, this is in addition to the um, over a billion dollar investment in securing um, the Oxford vaccine that AstraZeneca is in, um, producing and uh, the uh, letter of intent for um, uh, production of the University of Queensland um, vaccine. So that sort of investment demonstrates um, the broad range of vaccine opportunities that Australia has at its disposal and also a recognition that COVID-19 vaccine technology is going to need to continue to be developed, to continue to be improved uh, throughout 20 2021 and beyond. Finally, just like to note, uh, being a father of three myself, of course, that there are uh, school holidays coming up and around the rest of Australia, uh, what that means and, and regional, indeed regional Victoria, what that is going to mean is movement. And we know where there's movement, there's potential movement of COVID-19. So when you're out on your school holidays, um, make sure to remember the COVID-3, uh, keep your distance, uh, wash your hands, uh, don't interact with others if you're unwell. Uh, work out where the nearest COVID testing facility is for, the, uh, for your particular holiday destination. And if you are sick on that day that you have to leave out of your major capital city, don't be the one that takes COVID-19 into uh, regional communities in Australia. Uh, this is the new normal for us. We need to be exceptionally cautious um, we, need to, we need to get our lives back on track and enjoy the school holidays and, and do what Australians do in the spring school holidays. Um, but we also need to do it, particularly in a COVID safe way. And uh, I've got um, some in the room and some on the phone, so I'll just go to Tamsin to start with.
slightly, with numbers coming down faster and different things being predicted. What's your understanding of, I guess, where we're at in, in comparison with the Victorian roadmap and are you getting any, any indications that Victorians are going to be out of restrictions early? Well, I think, once again, the, where the numbers are encouraging, we still have to see what they do on, in the coming days. And um, certainly if they continue down into um, single-digit territory, uh, there's, uh, there's no doubt that that will be provoking um, some thought on behalf of uh, the Victorian government about um, the roadmap and w when restrictions can be lifted. But I just wanted to... We do have to sound the note of caution here, uh, and that is um, simply to say that the effort that has uh, that Victorians have gone to so far, the incredible effort, uh, could could easily be undone, and and we don't want that to happen. Uh, we want um, we want those decisions to be made with caution and safety in mind, and, and we're confident um, that the Victorian uh, uh, Public Health Unit is is doing that, and we're providing advice as well uh, through through the AHPPC, um, and that um, the Victorian Public Health Unit has learnt so much and, and demonstrated. Um, improvements in the test trade is trace isolate system that can give Victorians confidence um, of that extra firepower uh, to be able to keep COVID-19 under control into next year. And just on this Victoria, I guess as well, has the HPPC ever given consideration to the impact of a, a curfew on spread of the virus? Has that been something that you believe would be beneficial or um, what's, what's the HPPC? Well, the, the, the curfew was, was obviously designed with an intent in mind, and, and that was to uh, restrict movement, uh, which, as I, I said previously in, uh, in the press conference, is, is part of the key way that, is the key way that COVID-19 spreads around. But as a public health measure, um, it, it was never debated or discussed within uh, the HPPC itself. And I'll just go to the phone, and then I'll come back to the room. Uh, we might start with Matt. saying there about um, the, the, the hard work that Victorians have done could easily be undone and your warning there uh, to uh, members of the public who are go be going on holidays, during school holidays, travelling around a bit more. Are you concerned that we might be experiencing a bit of a lull at the moment and as soon as people do start to travel around more and what are restrictions are, are lifted between places like the ACT and, and Queensland and South Australia that we could start to see Well, Matt, it's, it's always going to be a balance, and we're clearly uh, looking at numbers within uh, seven out of the eight jurisdictions in Australia um, that do allow um, movement within um, states from um, urban to regional areas, from uh, Sydney um, down to the south coast, or indeed from Canberra to the south coast on, on school holidays. So there would be no point at the moment in restricting that sort of movement, because the, the numbers um, would simply not favour that as a, as a proportionate response. But, uh, as I've said on, on more than one occasion, uh, you know, government, the HPPC, uh, we can't do this on our own. So with those numbers being low, um, the obvious way to keep them low, um, but to, uh, to keep our school holidays as close to as how they usually are, is to, is to be as safe and COVID safe as possible. And that's going to be a responsibility um, for everybody and will be a responsibility as we lift um, state borders as well. There's the opportunity now for residents of the ACT um, to go to South Australia. Don't get on that plane if you're unwell or at all feeling unwell. Uh, I think you can get your money back um, these days if you're, if, you're, if you're crook and you don't go on the flight. You're doing every, the whole community a, a favour. So um, the, the licence to move is not a licence to move unsafely. We might go to uh, Dana. Uh, thanks, Dr. Craigsworth. I've actually got two questions. Sure. Um, the first one is about the uh, Centre for Disease Control in the United States. Um, the news overnight that they're saying airborne transmission is one of the main ways that COVID is spread. Um, the AHPPC still says this is not a significant factor. I'm just wondering what the uh, Americans are seeing that the um, infectious control expert group uh, that advises you is not. 
Thanks, thanks, Dana. So I have seen the uh, Centre for Disease Control recommendations, and uh, my reading of that, in fact, um, I think uh, the wording is fairly clear that there's an increase in what we call aerosolisation. Uh, and what they've suggested is the main mode of transmission is aerosol transmission, which is not quite airborne transmission in the in the um, purest sense of the word. But what does that mean for Australian national guidance? Um, basically, uh, it has always been the case that uh, Australian guidance, US guidance, European guidance has recognised that aerosols are produced um, by someone who has COVID-19 and um, that they can be inhaled by someone in close proximity and can be a form of transmission. So as I'm speaking to people now in this press conference, um, about this far away at least, uh, my speech is creating aerosols and, and that, that, that aerosol um, can contain COVID-19. Whether it is the main mode of transmission or not is one of the issues that's currently under debate. And we've seen that there's uh, been a shift from the centre of disease control I didn't see the references that were published on the website um, that they are using to base that decision. It is the position of other major organisations, uh, our own Australian Health Protection Principal Committee, the European CDC, um, Public Health England, uh, that the main mode of transmission um, is contact and droplet and there's an increasing recognition that aerosols uh, uh, have a role. Now, what has Australia done about that? Well, during the Victorian second wave, uh, the guidance on when to use N95 masks, which are the ones that protect you from transmission of airborne uh, infectious disease, was expanded such that uh, any patient within a hospital in Victoria at the moment uh, either suspected the so-called SCOVID or COVID uh, positive patients are being treated by practitioners um, using an N95 mask. And that was an important step recognising that role of aerosolisation. So that's a long answer, but I wanted to um, make sure that people were very clear um, that both the Infection Control Expert Group, the AHPPC, um, and federal and state, uh, and state health departments have all recognised the important and growing role of aerosols in the transmission of COVID-19. We continue to look at the evidence on a daily basis. You've got a second question, Dana. Uh, yes, thanks, Doctor. It's a, sort of a related question. So the latest AHPPC guidance um, on, on PPE states that SIP testing is the minimum standard for each occasion of use of a P2 or N95 mask and that these don't, are not protected if they don't fit properly. Um, it also says that SIP testing of all healthcare workers who may need to use one of these masks will be difficult to accomplish due to limited supplies and range of types or sizes available. We've been told throughout this pandemic that the federal government has plenty of PPE. Now it turns out that we don't even have enough of the right masks for healthcare workers to access ones that fit them properly. What's the AHPPC advice to the government now on procurement and manufacturing of these masks to ensure that we do have adequate supply? Well, thanks, Dana. There's a number of elements to that question. Um, the first one is I just need to um, point out that the minimum standard recommended um, under national guidance is in fact a fit check uh, and, and although it's um, challenging to explain in a, in a press conference I'm going to have a go because it's important. Um, a fit check otherwise known in the US as a seal check when you put on an N95 mask um, you make sure that it's adequately moulded around your face and that you can't feel obvious air leaks either usually around the chin or up around the bridge of the nose. Easy for people um, with glasses of course because they'll fog up. Um, now, that is the minimum standard, and that is what anyone must do before they go into a room, someone with suspect uh, COVID-19 in Victoria or COVID-positive in Victoria at the moment. Um, that has always been uh, the minimum national standard. A fit test is different. A fit test works out what mask is best for you as an individual, noting that blokes with beards have to shave to wear an N95 mask. A fit test is something that's commonly performed by an infection control practitioner or um, an occupational medicine specialist and actually uses a machine um, to determine how much leak is around a particular mask. So they're two different things. And the fit test was acknowledged 
and is acknowledged by European CDC, even US CDC, as uh, a challenging policy, um, uh, policy tool to be able to roll out during a pandemic. In Australia, only South Australia had respiratory protection programs and fit testing prior to this pandemic. And now most jurisdictions, I understand, are considering fit testing programs and Victoria announced theirs last week. We welcome um, that announcement. It's absolutely critical. To move to the second part of your question, in terms of supply of N95 masks and what is actually available um, on the market. The commercial market at the moment is robust um, for N95 masks. Um, whether you're um, an aged care provider, whether you're a state health service or a private hospital, um, you should be able to access a range of different N95 types. Some of those now are being produced in Australia um, and prior to uh, this pandemic, no N95 masks were produced in Australia. They are now produced in a range of different sizes uh, and shapes and that there are sufficient masks for fit testing programs to be uh, undertaken by jurisdictions. Uh, so the last thing I'd say is that there are still, however, um, some very popular masks, uh, such as uh, some of the 3M series, that are still difficult to get on the uh, national market. So the important thing for any fit testing program is range of masks and sizes of masks, and that they uh, should be sufficiently commercially available in Australia at this point in time uh, for employers to start respiratory protection programs. We'll just move, I think there's one more person on the call. Yes. Yes, go ahead, who's that? Paul. It's Paul. Paul, Paul Osborne from AAP. Um, just um, wondering how concerned you are about the drop off in testing rates. Um, by, by my calculations, they're down about 30% over the last three weeks. And do you have any sort of theories on why it is actually happening and whether it's in particular areas or particular demographics or, or what, what the situation is there? Well, well, Paul, I think we've all expressed um, concern about the, the decrease in testing rates. Uh, after all, the strategy is to detect people who have symptoms of, the, of COVID-19 and then you find your clusters and the clusters um, can be uh, sorted out before they turn into to, um, outbreaks. Uh, so we can only ask Australians if, with even the most minimal of symptoms, even if you think you've got hay fever, if you haven't had a COVID-19 check, um, you need to go and get tested. Um, with regard to how public health units are actually targeting their testing, um, they're very aware of the need occasionally to do what we call asymptomatic testing, which has been discussed here before, where um, certain groups of people who are showing no symptoms at all but have been designated as close contacts uh, of um, people with COVID-19 are encouraged to go and get tests. Uh, and that's an important tool as well. How do we lift um, testing rates? It's actually, a, it's actually going to be a challenge because uh, we're moving into uh, the months of the year where there's less respiratory virus. There have only been 36 deaths from influenza this year. And so... Uh, it's challenging to get people to get out and get tested if they're, if they're not exhibiting uh, symptoms. So I think, to, to sum up, I think there's going to be a natural decrease in, in the number of tests being done because of less respiratory symptoms, but just a, a big caution um, that just because we're entering the summer months, this will have no impact on our risk of COVID-19. We just saw the first and second waves in the Northern Hemisphere to, um, taking place during the summer months. Uh, and so we, we can't at all be complacent. And just to follow up, mm. is it possible that the, the drop in testing rates is actually skewing the number of positive cases that, that we're seeing? As in the number of uh, drop in numbers might yes. um, be masking uh, a true uh, number of undetected cases out there? Correct. Well, the percentage positivity has stayed the same, even in Victoria, which only, I think, recorded 7,000 7, tests. Um, and those numbers are getting um, quite low now. So I, I don't think it's going to be masking a, a, a large number of undetected cases. What I do know, though, is that there's a, a big focus in the local gov affected local government areas in uh, Victoria around Casey where they've had the most recent cluster um, and so a, a large number of those tests will be being conducted in those pop-up clinics um, which should be of some reassurance. And I'll just go back to the room and, and if you like to stay on the line I can offer you a couple more questions as well. Can I ask you more questions? Yeah, yes, Tamsin.
should that person be fined or are you worried that that would have an adverse impact on people telling the truth during those important interviews? Well, I think the principle is that we want to do things that are going to encourage people to be as open as possible. Uh, and so um, no matter um, what reason you may have um, for wanting to uh, conceal information to a public health official, um, please don't do it because it has um, some very widespread uh, um, implications for your community. Uh, with regard to enforcement, um, that, is a, that is a difficult question and it needs to be one that I think is made on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and we've seen in Victoria clearly uh, the decision was made um, with certain um, members of households not um, to find them because they were forthcoming with information. Uh, and um, for that particular case, um, with um, that particular information available to the um, Victorian health authorities, that is the decision um, that they made. So I, I think you can expect um, to see um, some variability with that. Um, there's, uh, uh, but, but fundamentally that'll be a matter for the um, state who's enforcing the, um, the fine. At the start of the pandemic, when the national restrictions came in, we heard that it was hard to tell which of the restrictions we had been successful in suppressing the virus because they'd come in also quickly at the same time. Given that it was a more staggered approach in Victoria with the second wave, is there anything that we've learnt about what works and what doesn't and what could be implemented moving forward, specifically looking at Victoria? Well, I, th I think we, we've learnt a lot of things, but I don't think we've um, come to the conclusion about which of, the, which of the measures is likely to give you the biggest bang for your buck. In, in particular, the particular example is the masks. Um, it's very difficult to unpack the effect of mandatory mask use, um, although undoubtedly there was an effect. Um, so uh, were the numbers to uh, increase, um, certainly in, in states like um, New South Wales and Queensland or anywhere around Australia, I think the threshold for implementing um, mandatory community masks is going to be a lot lower now as a result of the Victorian experience. Um, but in terms of the um, staggering of restrictions, I think um, we understand that households are a major focus of infection um, and as you've seen with the Victorian roadmap and um, most other states and territories will put in um, restrictions on household numbers as one of the early interventions. Um, so they're, they're two examples of things that we've learnt, there, there are others. And I'll just go back um, very quickly to see if uh, either, Matt, do you have another question before we finish up? No, thank you. Dana, did you have another question? Dana might have hopped off the line. And Paul, did you want another question? Uh, no, I'm fine, thanks. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we'll look forward to updating you later on in the week. Thank you.